If you've been watching uh, 100 Huntley Street the last uh, few days, you've uh, been listening with real interest to Joe Amaral. If you're meeting him for the, for the first time, he uh, is the host of a program on CTS called First Century Foundations. He's also the author of a best-selling book, Understanding Jesus, and he has just created a new DVD, a beautiful DVD called God's Holy Days. Uh, Joe, there's a lot of symbolism, a lot of imagery mm -hmm. that relates to the holy days of Israel. But one imagery that is very fascinating, that's not necessarily a holy day per se, mm. but that's the business of the Jewish wedding. And, and, oh, the, yeah. and, and the reference again and again in the scripture to the, to the bride of Christ. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, as a guy, being called the bride of yeah. Christ. Yeah. Doesn't really appeal. <laughs> I'm sorry, never <laughs> sat with me over the years. <laughs> and I said, Maybe there's something Jewish about it. Maybe it's symbolic. I don't know what it means, Lord. Yeah. But there must be a significance. There must be a symbolic, you know, mm -hmm. meaning behind it. And um, like I've done with all the other teachings, I began to research. And, well, if I'm the bride of Christ, well, what does that mean? Well, the first mistake most people make is we think of a bride in the context of today, right. of a 21st century wedding. And if you do that, you'll completely miss the boat. You'll miss all of Jesus' teachings about the end times. Right. Uh, because the bride today and the bride in the Second Temple period had completely different roles. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, today <laughs> the bride is the star of the show. Right. You know, she's the one who does all the planning, she does the booking, uh, she gets the menu in order, she picks the venue, the date, the whole shebang. And she wears the dress. She wears the dress. <laughs> when she comes in the door, everybody stands up and looks at her and the poor schlep stands at the front of the church. <laughs> He's, you know, just happy to show up, yeah. you know. and. Uh, so the groom takes this really, really back seat, you know, role. Mm. But then you go back to the time of the first century and you realize, oh my goodness, it is completely different. I began to study. I began to look uh, at documents that chronicled weddings and practices all around the classical world from uh, Mesopotamia, Syria, Babylon, you know, Israel, that whole region. And there was a lot of similarities. And the first thing I noticed was, was the role difference. And I finally understood, ah, that's why the church is called the bride. In the temple times, the bride pretty much did nothing. Hmm. It was the groom who did everything. The groom was the one who selected the day. He's the one who selected the venue. He prepared the home. He decorated the home. How many ladies would trust their husbands today to decorate their homes, right? There'd be moose head and, and bass on, on the walls, right? But it was completely reversed. The groom had responsibilities. He had to care for the bride. He had to make all of the provisions. And all the bride had to do was prepare herself, make herself ready for the return of her groom. And uh, on the DVD, they're going to see, I, I devote a good chunk of the teaching, almost a full hour, uh, to this, this wedding practice. Because there are so many parallels. When we look at answers that Jesus gives about the end times, He'll give an answer many times and we'll look at it and we'll say, well, I guess it's significant. It's in the Bible. It's holy, but I don't really know what it means. And um, as I began to study these documents, things leapt off the page. Let me give one mm. example because, you know, later on in the show, you know, we are going to teach about mm. it in much more detail. But one of the things that really struck me is, um, you've been to your, your share of weddings. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to a Portuguese wedding? No. Okay. Uh, we'll try to arrange that for <laughs> you. Portuguese weddings are fun. No, they're like Italian weddings, like mm -hmm. Greek weddings, like most European weddings, very big. Yeah. And uh, what happens is during uh, the, the celebration at the hall, not during the church service, but later at the meal, they, they take the shoe of the groom and the bride and they pass it around. Uh, and when they do, you put money into the shoe. Right. Uh, I was at a friend's Greek wedding, and they have a big suckling pig, <laughs> and you shove money in its mouth, <laughs> and you get to dance with the bride. Yeah. And, you know, that money helps, you know, to offset the cost mm. uh, of the wedding. And uh, when I was studying, even the way dresses were made, I noticed there was something called a wrinkle that was put into the dress. And that caught my attention. I said, hang on a second, the Bible says he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. We know that refers to sin, that's mm -hmm. definitely one of them. But there's also a very practical response and reason for that. I learned that if you took a piece of material and you folded it in on itself, it would create a pocket. And from a distance, it would look like there was a wrinkle in the dress. And what would happen is that when the woman would walk down the aisle past the guest, people would put money into the wrinkle. 
mm -hmm. and that would help pay for the sacrifice that the man made for this wedding. Mm -hmm. And look at what Jesus says. I'm coming back for a bride. No wrinkles necessary. Everything's paid. I've paid it. You've been bought at a price. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I mean, I was like, I get it. I understand my role now as part of the bride. And this is the kind of teaching that people can expect when they start studying God's holy days. Not just my DVD, not just our ministry, but when you study the Hebraic roots. I don't know about anybody else. I hope they get excited about that kind of a teaching because it makes sense. The practical, actual culture really lends light to understanding. Now, the bride uh, imagery, of course, relates to uh, a wedding. And uh, the scripture has all of this symbolism, especially in the book of Revelation, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Absolutely. Um, what, 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 what have you learned or what do you think you've learned about <laughs> Jesus return one day and, 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 and the feasts, do you, do you see him engaging in and or fulfilling some of these, uh, these feasts we've been talking about? Okay, how much time do we have? Because th this is a whole hour, seriously, do we have two or three minutes? Uh, we've got about four minutes. Okay, in, in four minutes, I'll give you an, an hour's worth. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we learn about, about the second coming, mm -hmm. about you know, prophetic end time mm -hmm. events? Well, the feasts, you know, you know, they're broken into two main categories. The first four are, are the, the fulfilled feasts. You know, he was our Passover lamb. He was the unleavened bread, no sin, no sin. He was the first fruits that went to heaven. We see and in Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit. He fulfilled the first four on their actual days. Really, really important. Not around Passover or kind of close to it. On the actual day, he fulfilled them. If then, at his first coming, all four were fulfilled on their actual days, I think it's logical and reasonable to assume then that the prophetic feasts, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles, rapture, second coming, millennium, I think it's logical to move in that way of thinking that he will fulfill those end time feasts on their actual days. Now, I'm not going to venture to say for a second, oh, I know when he's coming. The Bible says that we can know we don't know the day or the hour, but we know the season. And the season, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, is a picture of the rapture. It talks about the Lord uh, blowing the trumpet, and at the sound of the trumpet, those who are alive will be caught up to meet Him in the air. There's a lot of imagery associated with the rapture and the second coming with the Feast of Trumpets. So what I can say with, 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 with confidence and certainty is that, you know, the end time events will, will take place around these times of the year around the festivals. Now, can you say he's coming September 2011? Can you say, I mean, do you remember a book in 1988, 88 yeah. Reasons Why, yeah. right? Yeah. You can get it for 99 cents on eBay now. Right. So it's not about predicting a date, but based on the fact that he fulfilled them on their actual days at his first coming, I think it's really strong to suggest that he'll fulfill these prophetic events on their actual days as well. Hmm. In terms of um, the everyday viewer, mm -hmm. What kind of practical impact should all of this uh, exciting information have on them? For me, that God is in control. Yeah. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's a God who keeps His promises. You know, He said He would send a lamb. He said the blood of this perfect lamb would remove my sin. So I, I can take that, you know, to the bank, so to speak. So it teaches me that He's trustworthy. So when He says He's coming back for me, when he says there's a place prepared for me in heaven, you know, after my dad died, that took on such new meaning. Mm. You know, what, what it does practically is that you can take God at his word, that when he says he's gonna do something, he's gonna do it. He's proven himself, he has a 100% tr you know, perfect track record. And if he says he's gonna do it, he's going to. Mm. And that is one of the beautiful thing about God's holy days. Mm. They show us that God is able and they show us that God is faithful. God